Hi everybody and welcome to Zoom Chats 2020. Today we have the absolute honor of getting a chance to visit with Sharon Babb. Now how would we describe Sharon Babb? She's a Lifetime Achievement winner, but not only that, she is a singer, a teacher, a mentor, a quartet singer, a champion director, a visionary leader, and an inspiration to all who get to learn from her. And this afternoon, we get to talk with Sharon. So welcome, Sharon. It's great to have you here today. Thank you for that glowing introduction. <laughs> and like you, we are we are sister baritones. Okay, <laughs> sister baritones unite. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And of course, I had to be a music judge. You know, I started as a sound judge, but a baritone has to go into the music category because it's the oddest of all categories, don't you know? <laughs> Are you calling the music category odd? <laughs> well, it's odd in some ways in that every music judge has to pass an arranger's test to get into the category, to make sure that they know what chords are, what the 11 chords are that we use in barbershop, and uh, so that they have the sense of concentration, because since we don't have the sheet music in front of us, we have to follow the music in our minds as the, the song goes on. So we don't want to be interrupted when the performance is going on because we are listening to everything that is happening within that song for the first time. It's, a lot of people yeah. say, uh, don't judges get tired of hearing the same song over and over again? The answer is no, because we never do hear the same song over and over again. It's different every time, even by the same performer uh, as well. So uh, I guess I'm fascinated by music and, and fascinated by the fact that when you put a human touch to a piece of music, it's always different. So we, I always have said that I think it would be great if International Convention had a preliminary round that was everybody in a plain black dress singing the same two songs. <laughs> well, that, that that would be a joy to judge, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't it be? <laughs> but it, oh, it would be so fat. It'd be a fascinating study because it would be when they used to do ice skating, you know, the, the right. technical round. Required um, figures. Yeah, so to get in the finals, you have to sing these two songs in your own way, and, you know, and have not have the costuming help. So that's just always, I think it would be a really interesting experiment. So the music category for, for all of us is a little bit of a mystery. That's why I'm very glad to be talking with you about it today. Can you share uh, the different elements that make up the music category and help us really understand them and put them to use right now when we're not rehearsing. Let me give you my overall view of how the judging categories work. I think the sound category sort of judges the instrument that we bring to the stage, either as an individual or as a foursome or as a chorus. And so the sound that those instruments make uh, become the basis for this judging in that category. Uh, the expression category has a lot to do with uh, the music that we've chosen and whether we are communicating emotionally the, the lyrics and the pulse and uh, all of the nuances of the language that mm. goes into that. And then showmanship sort of takes us beyond uh, emotional communication to a real in touch with the audience communication where we become a character and, and actually dramatize the music and make it come alive. The music category judges the what we have chosen to sing and how we choose to sing it. Uh, and, and so uh, you put all those four categories together and it is a real quartet of covering all of the barbershop art form as well. Now in particular, in, in the every category is divided into percentages except for the expression category, which is 100%. And in music, there's a a division of 30% for song and arrangement and 100 and pardon me 70% for the performance of that song right. and arrangement and so it's the 30% that a lot of people get hung up on uh, because uh, there's just some music that's better for barbershop than other music let's face it some music has a melody that uh, uh, that applies itself to the barbershop chords to the big three of the 11 chords that ring by themselves and that's an important aspect there are three chords that ring all acoustically by themselves but when you put the human voice to it they ring even better and become overtone chords and so uh, the more you have of those within a song the better that's going to be because as Rini craig always told us she who rings the most chords wins so it's it's always good to have music that has those chords built in but there's more to it than chords it's uh the song has to be structured in such a way that there's an arc of a story 
-hmm. or in an uptune there's a tempo and a rhythm that keeps your heart beating in some way and a character evolves uh, through all of that uh, there's also harmonization whether the chords go in a progression that makes sense and you can always hear the melody it's not being obscured by a lot of uh, harmonic differences or secondary chords and then the music judge uh, like the sound judge has to be able to isolate voices and hear the bass line by itself or hear the tenor line by itself to see if the what we call the voice leading whether the notes actually lead in a logical progression from one to another and and so we have to be able to isolate and hear those parts one at a time besides hearing the whole so all of that goes into the 30%. It's a very complicated kind of uh, thing, and, but it's only a third of the performance uh, in terms of percentage. The actual performance that takes 70% uh, will include the things that the sound category concentrates on, which are uh, the vocal skills and the harmony accuracy. That has to be there as a basic. But the performance of barbershop style, how you sing that song in terms of tempo, rhythm, musical unity, musical artistry, uh, phrasing, dynamics, all of the things that you bring to the music and make it your own, that goes into the 70%. So uh, that's that's a more major factor. So the, the bottom line is you need to choose a song that fits the, the category, but a song that you can sing well, because that's where the points lie. So I know that when music judges are commenting, they're often uh, sharing with a performer that a music is a piece of music is beyond their reach. The technical aspect, a song is too hard for them. What are the things that t tell you that as you are writing a score sheet? Some of the things that tell me whether a, a song is, uh, is suitable for a, a, a chorus or a quartet include these things. Do I have to look at my watch during a ballad? Is it too long? Is it is it to the point where I have lost the entire message as well? So I always tell chorus and quartet members, choose a short ballad, especially if your performance level is about C or B minus or that sort of thing, because it's just uh, it's it's very difficult to maintain uh, musical integrity through a long song. So that's one thing: is how long and tedious does it seem to be? Am I getting the message of the hook in a, in a ballad, especially? In other words, if the title is the hook, am I getting that message over and over again? Is there structure? Do you tell me what you're going to tell me in the intro, tell me in the body, and then tell me what you told me in the conclusion? So that like a good essay, it unfolds itself as it goes along and makes a story that makes me feel complete at the end of it. And then another thing that I look for is whether at the climactic chords, uh, at, at either at the ends of uh, big phrases or at the climax or especially at the tag where everybody's running out of breath, is that within the tessitura? Is that within the, the singing ranges of whoever has that chord and that spread, especially between the tenors and the basses uh, usually as well. So I look for those what I call pillar chords the chords that the song is built on and whether they're within the ranges of the, the people themselves. I can also tell sometimes, especially in quartets, whether uh, the lead is coaching the rest of the, the quartet and uh, the others are just following rather than taking uh, command of the music themselves. So those are some of the, the mileposts that I see in determining whether a song is suitable or not. That's great. So I love that you're talking about the um, the story arc that you, we tell you in the intro and then we say it again in the body and then we say it again in the tag. When you were saying that, what came to my mind was um, singing par The Parting Glass, where it ends on a chord that doesn't really resolve. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. It's very intentional. That is not a, a, a contestable piece, but that one makes you hold your breath in a way that is... <gasps> And it's, it's, yes, it's an incredible effect, but that's not what we're using as educational vehicles in the contest setting. And that's why we have all of these descriptors and pieces of this category. To that's right. Choose a, a, a piece of music. One other thing that uh, I make a point of is that barbershop music, when it's written well and arranged well, should be able to be sung by the average singer so that the ranges, for example, don't go beyond the ranges of the average singer. Uh, in many of our 
our finest quartets and choruses, they can go beyond the envelope and because they have uh, ranges that can cover those huge spread chords. But barbershop music at its basis should be able to be sung by the average singer, not a prima donna. In our chorus setting, the music is is chosen to us, given to us, and we're often told what the group is feeling about the song, the emotion that we're trying to present, the story that we're giving, the way that we're telling the, this um, journey. Um, so what can that average singer use in the music category descriptors in that category as education for how to make themselves a better performer? Especially uh, the uh, items under the performance uh, at the top of the score sheet are things that you can think about because you're right, the, the music is usually prescribed by people who are smarter than we are, our consultants, our, our arrangers, our, our music team, our directors, etc. But if we understand we have to bring vocal skills, we have to bring harmony accuracy, we have to understand what tempo and rhythm and synchronization are within a group. Th those are the kinds of things, plus uh, understanding the plan uh, for phrasing and dynamics. But in the higher level courses, you've got to uh, make sure that that plan is intuitive so that it comes to you naturally uh, as well. And uh, at the highest levels, the difficult should look easy. It should look as if we could all go up there and sing some of these um, marvelous arrangements when in fact we really sh can't usually. <laughs> and, and just like any other skill, or I mean, if we were at the Olympics, it would not be uh, a winnable situation if you just brought in the average kind of uh, song. But uh, for most of us who are garden variety singers, we can take average as we make this journey through all of the levels. And uh, one other thing I'll add is that uh, when you're at the C level, then you should be working on the sound category. At the B level, the sound and music category. At B plus and A minus, the sound, the music, and the expression category. But it's finally the, sh the fine finest points of showmanship that take you into the A plus category. Right, oh, that's absolutely wonderful. I have always been fascinated by our judging system because it is layers of learning and the levels really match exactly um, what our singers are learning to accomplish. Our That's right. Singers. So of course I love that you said sea level, we focus on vocal skills. One of the things I've, I've always wanted to ask music judges, there's a lot of commentary on score sheets about phrases and energy dying down. So can you talk about a, a, one of the, the ways to combat that? It's typically the second half of the song. Yes, uh, if you're singing a, a ballad that's well structured with the intro and the body and the conclusion, then you have to look into the fine points of the body. And the body is usually made up of two A's, a bridge and a third A, okay? And uh, the, the three A's is tell the same message, but in different ways. And so uh, it's important, I think, for the singer to understand that those A's aren't equal that uh, the story has to unfold in, in, a, in a bigger way and that they're going to have to save their stamina for the third A, uh, <laughs> which usually has a modulation and a big tag coming after it uh, as well. So just like with any, um, any performance, you're gonna save your best trick for the, the end of the performance, your, your best, whatever it happens to be in gymnastics or whatever, mm -hmm. that's where it has to be. So you have to build easily. A lot of courses give it away too soon. And so uh, they end up uh, maybe extending the phrases in the first A or the second A, but by the third A, they don't have it anymore. And the bridge is always very difficult because um, it, it is a relief from the other A's. It gives us a different viewpoint usually, and it usually has more chance for accuracy error in the bridge uh, uh, as well. So you've got to be really smart about singing uh, these chords uh, throughout the whole thing. I will say this too, in an uptune, uh, it may have the same structure, but usually uh, if you're singing a medley, and I wouldn't suggest that until you're at the B plus level, because the second song is always more difficult, then you have to have a modulation and come back to the first song even stronger than you did it the first time uh, that that's that too has a structure within it so I think people have to learn to pace themselves when they they sing and not take all of the great big breaths at the beginning of the song but yeah. save them for the end you've got to have stamina at the end you must know that in showmanship especially 
I'm looking at the stage, the other judges are looking down, but we all get an impression of an energy loss. We, we perceive it in a different way depending on our category elements, but it's really obvious. Um, visually, I think it's the easiest to see, and then the other three categories cover the fact that the ear hears that fatigue. And a lot of us will write things like, oh, your energy, you, know, you didn't sustain your energy today. Because we understand that they may have had uh, the month before three weeks where they were nailing that song every time, but it had been in the performance that one chance we get to put it out there to be adjudicated, the adrenaline rush, the tempo that may be new <laughs> because everyone's a little bit excited. There's just a, that little bit of sense of loss, and I can always see it on the faces. Like As Mavis Burden has always said, the eye sees before the ear hears. Yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, that's exactly right, because it, as you said, we can we can hear it in uh, uh, the breathlessness, right. that kind of thing. So the ends of the songs, uh, uh, you have to craft a song so that it comes to a conclusion as well. And our best singers can do that. Well, I think it's uh, as a tool right now, as particularly because choruses are working so hard to learn songs virtually and there's a whole different set of circumstances that we've all been handling but quartets could certainly sit down in a zoom session and go over a song that they are considering in the way that you have described identify the the three a's make sure they're there talk about the bridge and they don't necessarily have to be fantastic at music theory in order to do this so that's right and then they there's a lot of people they could reach out to so who would you recommend they would ask um, for advice about songs that they're choosing for competition. Uh, let's let's just talk about the technical aspects of the thing. Uh, if you have any music teachers within uh, within your group, uh, asking them about chord structure and about melody and, and progressions. I, I mean, that's a basic way to start because all music uh, is consumed by those things. Right. But every director, starting from the C level on up, needs some consultation about music choice from an arranger or a, a music judge or a trusted consultant of, of some kind, because those people have to be able to listen to a lot of music and to hear the structures and to hear the chords that, that are there as well. And so making friends with people who love music and who listen to it a lot is a, a key factor in determining who should be a consultant to your music team. Wonderful. And right now is the best time to reach out. You know, uh, we're all feeling the strain a little bit of not being able to create live music together, but it's a really good time to reach out and get input about the structure of the songs you have been working on if you don't have anyone locally to ask. So, And as a matter of fact, uh, it brings up what my good friend CMA Judy Vidal said to me that you can work all day at the piano and put an arrangement together, but it means nothing until you hear the voices singing it. Right. And so our arrangers are, are, are hungry for people to use their music in any way that they can. Yes, absolutely. So it's been really wonderful talking to you about the category today. I know we could talk for hours about this. Um, we both have been a part of it for a long time and seeing the benefit of people being adjudicated by fairly strict um, parameters, which helps those average singers that you mentioned increase their skills. That's the way I think about competition. I know there are awards and all those other things, but all four of the categories right now, the descriptors at the top of each page, can be used right now for us to continue learning how to be better performers. so Absolutely, and I can't wait until we all perform again in shows and uh, in uh, singing engagements and in competition uh, as well. Yes, we were talking, uh, uh, Sharon and I were speaking before we got on camera about that first breath that we all take in a large room together and the first chord that we create. It's going to be wonderful. We're going to be having a cry fest. I don't think we'll get past the first chord. I think we are. <laughs> it'll be one chord and then it'll be, then it'll be over. <laughs> That's right. So, well, thank you so much. And I hope that you and your husband stay safe and continue to be healthy. And we will look forward to seeing you again in another Zoom room. And then hopefully in the near future in person. Thank, thank you, you so Renee. Thank you so much.